autofocus in video needs to be accurate, it needs to be able to lock on to subjects, and very importantly, it needs to be smooth. In this video, I'm going to be going through my experiences with autofocus, mostly with the FX9, both the good ones and the painful ones. <laughs> Getting into bloody manual focus mode. Where's the switch? Where's the switch? It was getting to know those settings that made the huge difference between having great autofocus and utterly unusable autofocus, because nobody wants that, do they? Whilst the FX9 is the camera that I will be using for most of these demonstrations, a lot of what I'm talking about is completely applicable to the more recent Sony cameras and the more recent Canon cameras too. And some of this will also apply to recent Fujifilm cameras like the X-T3, X-T4 and GFX100. And their autofocus can be really good but it is incredibly dependent on the settings again, and especially the lenses. And I will be doing a separate video all about getting the right lenses for great video autofocus performance. I am absolutely certain that high quality video autofocus is something we're gonna see in all cameras in the future. If you've seen my two hour long FX9 review, yes, two hours long, some of the stuff in this video is going to be familiar to you because I have used extracts from that review. If you haven't seen it, I really do recommend watching it. I know two hours is a long time and I know I am biased, but I actually think it is very entertaining and very informative. It is the best review I've ever made. If you have not enjoyed yourself at the end of it, I will refund you for your time. Just send me your invoice to spam at philipbloom.net When I mention autofocus online quite frequently I am met with things like autofocus is for amateurs you can't be a professional if you use it well I say poppycock to that any tool that can be used to help us and make our life easier whilst filming should be embraced. Autofocus has been on a journey, a very slow journey. There's absolutely no point in having it if it doesn't work. It needs to be accurate, it needs to be smooth, and it needs to be reliable. If you cannot trust the autofocus, you cannot use it. In September 2019, I was invited to try out a mystery new camera. Of course, it turned out to be the FX9. The full frame video camera I've been waiting for, something that ticked most of the boxes for what I needed in a professional large sensor video camera. I didn't get much time at all with the camera, maybe a couple of hours, and I concentrated on autofocus because I really wanted to see if we finally had a large sensor camcorder from Sony with fantastic autofocus that I could use professionally. I do get some ridiculous comments on social media, things like, well, if your production can't afford a focus puller, then perhaps you shouldn't be doing it. This may be news to some people, but not everybody works in narrative fiction or high-end commercials where you get a focus puller. I probably had a focus puller maybe half a dozen times or so in 30 years. Not very often. Most of the time, it's just me with my hand on the barrel of the lens. It looked really good to me, not perfect, but mostly that was down to me not knowing how to use the settings in the camera properly. If I'd shot this today, it would have been a lot better as I've learned so much about the camera since. Four. 
I got an FX9 for a couple of weeks in November 2019 and the first thing I did was really take a deep dive into the settings for autofocus to try and really understand it. My very first filming was to see just how well the face only and face priority modes worked. So in theory, when I step out of frame, it should stay this sort of shallowness in the background and not revert onto the background. Here goes. Did it work? Yeah. That's good, isn't it? That works pretty well. I don't even know what setting speed I set it to. If I switch to face priority, so I am the priority, of course, but if I step out, it will revert to the background. Nobody wants that, do they? There is another way of stopping it reverting onto the background, and I will show you that when we do some uh, what, following people shots and tracking shots. On this shot here, the FX9 has picked up this gentleman because he has the most prominent face in the frame. And on the Ninja, you can see the white box that shows that it's tracking him. And the yellow line underneath is a cursor. Because when there's some other faces, you can move that cursor with your D-pad on the camera to change who you want to be tracking. The most important tip I can give you is when using autofocus and tracking people is to make sure you have a shortcut on your camera for focus hold. By default, it is set to some native lenses on the actual lens itself but just put it on the camera on an easily accessible shortcut button. So when you get to that point when you want him to exit the frame, press the focus hold button and the motor will hold just there. Otherwise, when it loses him, it will revert to the background. When there's numerous people in the shot and you have face tracking on, it is going to get a little confused, especially if people are walking across each other. So that's where face registration comes in. So to use this mode, on the D-pad you press select when you have a box around somebody and then you get a double box. So now it shouldn't focus on any of the other faces, even though there are four other faces there. It should stay on this lady. Now it doesn't always work, there are occasions when it might lose them and when it does lose that focus, the focus motor should hopefully hold in that position until it sees the registered face again. It's not foolproof though. For the most part, it's worked really well. And that isn't just with native lenses. Right now I'm on the 35 1.8 and it's great, but I've also used the Sigma 105 1.4 quite a lot with the MC11 adapter because it's an EF mount version and it's worked really well too. A lot of stuff with the 70 200 28 GM, really good. The only issue that I've really had is with that face tracking. It gets confused. A lot of people, I feel like I have selected somebody, but it, it, somebody goes across, and even though it's in the locked on mode, which is the sensitivity number one, and I think I'm gonna have to move. I think this may really surprise you, but I love cameras and I love cats. I've got five wonderful cats and I've got 500 wonderful cameras, maybe. I mean, I do have quite a lot, but some people might say I have too many. Some might say I have a bit of a problem. There's so much to gain from kind of taking a personal look at our spaces, um, in our homes, 
to figure out what's overwhelming us. But after watching the Everyday Minimalism course by Erin Boyle on Skillshare, I think they may have a point. And if it wasn't for Skillshare sponsoring this video, I wouldn't have my epiphany by watching this clear and enlightening course. We have the power to do something about it. I'm always trying to broaden my mind and learn new things. Skillshare is giving away two free months of premium membership to the first 1,000 people who click the link in the description below. And after that, it's only around $10 a month. Now I've sold everything on eBay, this course on iPhone filmmaking by Caleb and Niles from Moment is a must. This is probably our favorite as filmmakers, an anamorphic lens kind of gives you the look that you see in the movie theaters, that wide aspect ratio, kind of some flares. I watch their YouTube videos all the time, but here the knowledge is distilled perfectly in this course. You want to make sure that focus is perfect, then you'll go straight over and manually adjust and it will lock it in. Manually? So I need to do more tests. So that's what I'm heading off to do right now is see my friends Julian and Guy at their production company, Terralon Media in Wandsworth, which is about seven miles from me. Hi, you see. Did that, you just cover my camera. Whilst you can see lots of different types of lenses, both native and adapted, this is not what this test was all about. That's coming up in a later test. Guys never look better. That's saying something. I wanted to see in particular how well that face only tracking worked. So if you're on somebody's face and you lose them, does it hold in that position? Way more controlled here than doing it out in the crowd in Richmond Town Centre with controlled subjects that I can actually direct, sort of. Most of the time I'm just going to be on the main Atmos Inferno screen so you can see in detail what's going on with the autofocus. And this is playing back in slow motion so I can go through this shot in particular. It's autofocus, face only. Not registration because there is two people I want to go from. Because in face registration, it will ignore the person who is not registered. So right now it sees Guy, as you can see in the square, perfect. And as I pan off of him, the focus motor disengages. Good, because it has lost his face. It only re-engages when it reaches Julian and it recognizes another human face, even just that part of his face. But as Julian turns around a little bit more, it then disengages because it's lost that face. It is now holding in that position. If another person entered the frame, then it would probably go onto them because it is on face only and not face registration. In which case I'd most likely press the focus hold button because I wouldn't want it to go onto them, I just need to wait for Julian to be a face again. And when he turns around after he's done his Instagram story, it picks him up again and we are working. Perfect result. The camera desperately needs the LCD screen to be touch enabled. It is a touch screen and thankfully it is going to be enabled in version two of the firmware around October 2020. It will just make selecting what you want to be in focus so much easier. You know, like the Sony stills cameras. Right now you've got to use the flexible spot mode, which is set up on one of my shortcuts. So you move the cursor. It is easy to use the joystick, which is on the hand grip, but when you're on a tripod, it's the other side of the camera. So here I'm just using the D-pad on the side. It does work, it's just not ideal. Touch screen would be so much easier. I don't actually know what constitutes a face for Sony. So I decided to try and draw my own. I didn't know that Sony was an art critic. I thought it was pretty accurate as a face, but apparently not. This sort of silliness is the perfect way to do these tests. But they are controlled and they are real world too. I can imagine many, many shoots where this sort of particular situation would come up. I mean, I've probably had a good couple of dozen just like this. Well, maybe that's a slight exaggeration, but this kind of unpredictability is definitely a big 
thing. What you don't want is for that autofocus to keep bouncing from the background to a subject. It will make it look awful and it will be unusable. In that sort of situation, you'd have to go to manual focus and you wouldn't stand a hope in hell of nailing it. So it seemed adding a little bit of extra facial hair meant that Sony now considered my drawing to be essentially photorealistic. Two equally handsome visages. I think the hair is a bit nicer on my drawing. <laughs> I mean, look, can you tell which is the human being there and which is my drawing? You had a nice day? What have you been up to? I've been filming. Mostly autofocus again. I oh, know. No, there's no animal eye autofocus on this. Sorry. Maybe one day. You never know. Even though there's loads of cats behind me, it won't focus onto those because it is for humans only. Some of the stills cameras from Sony do recognize animals for stills mode, but not in video. Hopefully that will come and it works really, really well. But it does need to be a human face for it to work. So that's why this section is called, what exactly is a human face? To get a shallow depth of field with a full frame camera it's actually very very easy, even at smaller f-stops, meaning to get that accurate focus you need to be pretty damn good on your focus barrel. You need to have a great EVF and great focus assist tools like peaking etc. Even then it's still hard, especially as the majority of us who are using these large sensor cameras are using photographic lenses, which really are not the greatest for any manual focus. Most of them have infinity focus rings with no hard stops. Some of them aren't even linear. They are focused by wire. This means trying to get manual focus accurately can be incredibly hard at times. If there's tools like autofocus which can help us, then great. I don't use autofocus for everything, it's just for certain situations. Autofocus isn't going to replace manual focus anytime soon. It's not going to replace focus pullers. It's just an incredibly useful tool. Things like this, which are added into cameras, are put there to help us. Yes, autofocus is a big thing, but there's things like viewing LUTs, waveforms to help us get exposure, bigger things like increased dynamic range, so if you have this old school mentality about autofocus, then why don't you get all of those removed too? 
I don't need autofocus, I've got a focus puller. I don't need a waveform, I've got a light meter. Well, to be totally blunt, if you think like that, you're being a bit of an idiot. Sorry. And this is the Canon 70D. Really the first camera to have proper, usable, continuous autofocus in full manual mode was the Canon 70D in 2013. And it was very good. Sony did have phase detection autofocus before that in its alpha cameras, but they had severe limitations. It wasn't until early 2014 when they brought out the mirrorless A6000 that we really saw proper video autofocus in a Sony camera with full manual control. Just after that in March, Canon announced new firmware for their C100 video camera, giving it dual pixel autofocus, although not in the same way as the 70D. It was just a small square in the middle. I did try it out and I was very impressed, but just having it in a center square made things very limited. The AX700, the NX80 and the Z90 were announced in September 2017 and they're the first video cameras from Sony to have this terrific autofocus system. They had initially been wary of me, after all they had been dumped there by a human, but now they'd really warmed to me and me to them. And of course I named them. That's Jim, or Jimmy on the left, and on the right that's Marley. I have the NX80 and it's a great camera. I used it for my Skiathos Kittens documentary series in the summer of 2018. It's a lot of running around in the heat and a lot of handheld actuality. So I needed a good lens, good range on it. I needed really good autofocus and I needed a flippy out screen because I had to film myself a fair bit. Apparently there's a kitten inside behind this electrical box here. Don't know how it got in, um, don't know how I'm going to get it out. We haven't heard it since we got here, but um, it's very noisy. But hopefully when it gets quiet, we'll be able to listen and try and coax it out somehow. I haven't used the latest Canon video cameras like the C500 Mark II and also the 1DX Mark III. The C200 autofocus is amazing. I use that for the Skiathos Cats documentary, the first one. I've used it for so many YouTube videos, corporate videos and documentaries. That ability to be able to do interviews and just leave the camera running and trust it is so essential for me. And of course, when I am filming myself, to be able to just know that it is keeping things in focus without me having to keep looking at the screen the entire time, which is not what you want. You want me to look at you, don't you? Cameras with just contrast-based autofocus just simply aren't smooth enough, or in my opinion, usable for video. Canon's dual pixel autofocus is a very clever system that uses just phase detection because it uses every single pixel to measure it. Sony cameras use a different system. They use a combination of phase detection to get that speed to get close to it, and the fine tuning is done via contrast. And that's called a hybrid system. And this is what the FX9 uses. The problem is, certain types of contrast do cause issues. If you've ever tried to get autofocus on somebody with a really bright background, even if you've got great phase detection autofocus, because it does use contrast as well, it will struggle. As my lovely Jimmy the Greek is a black cat and the background is much brighter, it does cause issues. What I could do is throw more light on him, uh, darken the background, and it would work a lot better. But this will happen whether it's a black cat or a person with a bright background. So these are the sort of issues you need to be thinking about when using autofocus. Canon's dual pixel autofocus will have this same issue as well when it has these really contrasty backgrounds. I promise this will be my last section of obsessing over the autofocus, but I am just going to do this um, very controlled test using Natalie the mannequin. 
and I've used her before in a video about um, how to practice your lighting because it's a great way of practicing your lighting and I don't think I'd find anybody willing to be filming with me at quarter past 11 on a Friday night for the next two or three hours to get this done. So that's why Natalie is there. And she's on the Rhino slider uh, with motorized head. So she's gonna rotate slightly and move backwards and forwards. Adding a few little conditions like rotating and seeing how it works. So what do you think, Lollipop? This was to see how face tracking and general autofocus works with various different types of lenses, both native and adapted lenses. I wanted to see at which point it would lose the face. And the amount of variables was huge. From the different types of lenses to the focus speed, the focus sensitivity, the focus area, face priority, face only, no face detection, the picture profiles because autofocus works much better when there is good contrast because it uses that as well as the face detection. From my experience so far, the autofocus still works really well in S-Log3 mode, just not as well as in a contrastier profile like s Cinetone. And then there's things like underexposure, overexposure, autoexposure, low base ISO, high base ISO. Just thinking about it now makes my head want to explode. I did my best. I didn't cover everything that was impossible but hopefully just enough to get an idea of what works and what doesn't work. So what were my findings? Kind of obvious really. The native glass worked way better in every mode and even did really well in some of the really challenging setups in Cine EI mode. Adapted glass with a normal Metabones and the speed booster both worked. They just didn't like the face tracking that much really not reliable. In normal mode, they were okay. But I must stress the okay, because autofocus that is okay isn't the same as autofocus that is usable. And to get great results, you really do need to use native glass. Although going back to that Sigma 105 Art, the 1.4 EF version with the MC adapter, it did so well. Maybe it's down to the fact that it's a newer lens. Some of the older Sigma lenses did well and some I couldn't get to work at all. But I think that's down to firmware. But yeah, that 105 worked like a native lens. And they do, of course, make E-mount lenses. I'm sure that new ones like the 35mm 1.2 will do just as well. Although without having one to test out, I am totally speculating. So these are our key focus settings. We have the transition speed, the sensitivity, the area which it scans. The transition speed is how fast the motor will react. So forgive me if I keep looking over at the screen because it's where the menu is on my monitor on the Ninja 5. So I have it set to four right now. Um, you can see the difference if I have it set to fast. But what's important as well is the sensitivity to knowing when it's moving so let's go to responsive one of the key things apart from your settings is going to be how good your lens is at this you can see it's not it got a bit thrown there that's because it's not on any face tracking mode and that definitely makes a difference because right now anything because it's on super sensitive anything i put close or it's going to be in frame it will switch to that which whilst is a is pretty cool and you can see how quick it is if you're doing something just on the face it's a bit of a nightmare you know even just something like your glasses but look how good it is look how fast it can be i mean look at that it is absolutely fantastic for certain things transition speed but the sensitivity is slow See what we have there is it's fast when it figures out there is something changing. It takes ages to realize that 
there is something more important. That's not good. This could be the optimum settings for this situation right now. You know, it could be more reactive, but it feels a little bit more organic. Now with face priority, it will literally do what it says. Prioritize the face when it comes to autofocus. It's on me, I'm the biggest in the frame, it's gonna default to me. What happens though, and I do what we did before, it loses me and goes on to another face you can see. Then it comes back onto me because I'm biggest in the frame. So there's a couple of things we can try. So we can try face registration. So I'm gonna press enter and now I get a double white box. So now it will not be distracted by any other faces at all. So even if that face becomes bigger in frame, it will stay on me. But if I do this, it still does the same thing. Face priority will always default to a face, even if you have a registered face. What can you do about that? Well, that's when you go into face only. So it should not be distracted by any other faces. But what about objects? Hand came onto me. Didn't go onto her, came onto me. Doesn't track though. Right? Now, tracks my face, hand up in front. Didn't do it move all the way really out of focus the problem is i'm barely a face i'm just a very very out of focus blur so in this sort of situation just use your manual focus override here to give a helping hand because it it is looking in the frame it is looking to see what is the face but if you're so blurred and so out of focus you may need to actually help it but this thing how do we stop this happening if we just want it to be a face? So I think this is a bug. Um, I'm pretty certain it's going to be fixed in firmware. Uh, I mean, I've already uh, given this information to Sony and sent them clips, so fingers crossed. It's not a massive thing, so I don't know how often you're gonna go. Hand! He didn't do that, can Hand! Hand? Oh my god, I fixed it. It's fine now. Look, I don't know what I did. <laughs> oh, God's sake. I'm, I'm losing it. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> I'm getting you to bloody manual focus, man. Where's the switch? Where's the switch? Give me the switch. So I gave my footage to Sony and they were very reassuring, saying that this is clearly not supposed to happen. And with all these examples, it's gonna really help to figure out what's causing this issue so they can sort out the algorithm. So you will never have to go through the experience of what I had to go through. Because the thing is, the autofocus works brilliantly. It's just on a couple of really extreme situations that it goes a bit funny. My faith hadn't been lost at all in the autofocus. It's still absolutely amazing. I just need to remember if I'm doing any interviews using autofocus, I just need to make sure that whoever I'm interviewing doesn't suddenly put their hand up in front of the camera and go, hand! Otherwise, I'll be fine.
since making the FX9 review, I really have seen just how different the lenses can be when it comes to the settings, because you know, some have faster motors, some have slower motors, and you really do need to tweak them depending on what you put on your camera. And it's not just the speed of that motor, it's the sensitivity too. It's the same with every camera I've used video autofocus with. It doesn't matter which brand it is. They all have their quirks when it comes to lenses and settings. The ability to change your settings though is really dependent on the camera. Some cameras have really fine tuning like the Sony FX9. But when it comes to the settings in the Sony stills cameras, it can be a little bit confusing because they're separate ones for stills and video. And part of those settings for stills does apply to video, basically the eye tracking. But when it comes to the main video settings, you've got very limited control. You can change the speed of the motor from fast to normal to slow. And on some cameras, it's actually only fast or normal. And the sensitivity can be either responsive or standard. You don't have anything like face only, which would be so useful. It's the same with the Canon stills cameras. They don't have face only as an option, but they do have it in their video cameras. I have the EOS R and it's a very good camera, but I don't really use it much, mainly because the 4K has that massive 1.8 times crop. To get full frame from this full frame sensor, you need to shoot in HD, but the upcoming R5 does seem to fix that. The specs show that it does have full frame 4K, which is uncropped. Also uncropped full frame 8K, not that I actually need 8K, I'm happy with the 4K, but the 8K will be a bonus. When I'm watching YouTube videos shot with the EOS R and Sony cameras too, when you have a brighter background than the person you're filming, the autofocus can easily come off that tracking. What we tend to see is people have their sensitivity too high and their motors too fast. So it reacts really quickly to the moments when it does lose that tracking. So it can jump to the background and then back again. Reduce that speed, reduce that sensitivity. And hopefully if it does lose tracking, by the time it picks it up again, it hasn't done anything drastic that makes your shot unusable. The Canon T200 and the FX9 both have really lovely fine control of autofocus in all modes. Unfortunately, it seems you can't change the sensitivity and the speed of autofocus when in tracking mode on either the EOS R and actually on my 1DX Mark II. With the EOS R, it's grayed out unless I go onto spot mode, which isn't a tracking mode. It's simply for going from one object to another via the touchscreen. So you can change the speed of your focus rack, which is very nice. But for any tracking mode, there is no ability to slow it down. The reason I've never really noticed this before is because the lenses that I use with my Canon cameras are not super fast during the video autofocus. So I don't have this crazy issue. It's the newer lenses that we're seeing on, especially the really lovely RF lenses for the EOS R. The motors are so fast and so responsive, it really needs the ability to bring both of those down. I was hoping that this was something that could be fixed via firmware, but what I'm told is it's down to the processor. The difference between the stills camera's processor and the cinema camera's processor. So for now, if you want to be able to dial down your RF lenses, you'll need to use a cinema camera. There just isn't a cinema camera from Canon right now that takes RF lenses. I hope there will be soon. I don't have any of the super fast, amazing RF L lenses to show you, but I can show you a comparison between three different types of lenses here. So this is the 16 to 35 F4 L. Uh, it's a lovely lens, but you can see the autofocus motor is not that fast. So for that sort of fast movement, it isn't able to keep up with me, but that's not bad because who's going to move like that normally? 
nobody really so if you're actually doing some walking around where it's tracking you that is actually really good because it's not going to overreact we don't want our lens to overreact as i hold up the xd4 you can see the way that the transition speed works here it doesn't jump so it's not too quick and it is confident as it grabs either my face or the camera ideally i would like to be able to increase the sensitivity and reduce the speed which would make it look much more natural this is the only rf native lens i got which is the 35 millimeter 1.8 macro it is not designed for this sort of thing it's a very slow lens because it is a macro lens and this is the 10 to 18 APS-C lens, uh, f4.5 to 5.6. It's the STM one, so it's nice and quiet. It's quick and it is smooth. The transition speed from an object is fast, but you can't tell because of the smaller aperture, which hides it really well. The settings for sensitivity and for speed with my Fuji X-T4 are absolutely essential to get great results. It's the difference between having autofocus that looks natural and smooth to autofocus that is jerky and very unnatural, which I don't want to use. The Fuji lenses perform so differently and that's why a setting that works well on one lens won't be perfect on another lens. Here, this is spot on, lovely and natural. I will be making that separate video, which is gonna show you which are the best Fuji lenses for video autofocus. Almost there, hope you're still with me. Since my autofocus obsession started back with the Sony A6000 and then especially with the Canon 1DX Mark II, it really has become one of the most important features I look for when buying a camera. Sometimes the other features will override the lack of great autofocus, but really it is in the top three essential features for me these days. I've been wanting a full frame video camera like the FX9 for a long time and before I even knew of its existence it absolutely had to have autofocus that was comparable to at least the A7R3 but with more features and without the limitations which almost all of Sony Steel's cameras have and that's the way that face tracking is disabled when you plug a monitor into the camera. Thankfully the a7R4 has fixed that and it looks like that's going to be the same for future cameras because the a6600 also doesn't have that limitation. But it still lacked any face priority or face only mode that my Canon C200 has. And I love my C200. Its autofocus is superb. I've never had any issues with its performance. I just wanted a full frame version. Now that has sort of come out since, albeit in a more high end and much more expensive C500 Mark II. Literally on the way into London for that event where I learned about the FX9's existence, Canon announced the C500 Mark II. And in many ways it appeared to be what I was after. But the price and the heavy crop for any frame rate over 60p did put me off a little as my C200 doesn't crop at all in any frame rate, even the high frame rates. Once I shot with the FX9 though, I fell in love with it. And it made sense as I was so heavily invested in Sony FE lenses. And with the FS7 being my main documentary camera for years, it really was the natural progression. As you've seen in this video, my quest to fully understand the autofocus and what works and what doesn't work with it has not been easy. But once I learned how to make the most of it, it's easily become the most impressive autofocus I've ever seen on any camera. The only downside being the lack of selectable object tracking other than faces and touch screen controls, which make it fiddly to use at times. The upcoming version two firmware fixes both of these 
and is bringing eye tracking as well, which is fantastic. It will really complete the camera in that department for me. Well, almost. I still want animal eye autofocus, please. Despite that lack of selectable object tracking, it still performed so incredibly well. At times it felt like some sort of AI knew what I wanted to be in focus. I mean, this shot here, this was set to wide, non-face mode. And somehow it knew to track those ducks. They weren't exactly prominent in the frame. How did it know? This is the best video camera that I have ever owned. It's simply amazing. The eye tracking on the A7R4 and a number of the other Sony cameras is incredibly good. We don't have it yet on the FX9. It is coming in the version two firmware. It's coming out in October, 2020, alongside loads of other features. And definitely one of my favorite features that's coming is that touch screen is being enabled, which is going to make things so much easier for touching people. That sounds wrong. So much easier for telling the camera what I want to be in focus, not just for tracking, but for doing rack focuses between one person or one object and another. Is eye tracking better than face tracking? Well, yes, because it is the eyes that we want to be in focus after all. Actually, in stills mode, we also have the ability to have eye tracking for animals. We just don't have it in video. And I really want to have it in video. Yes, it would be great when I do film my cats. For stills, it's great because their eyes are now in focus, whereas before it was their noses. But in video, it is still their noses. But it would also be really useful for people who aren't just filming their cats for wildlife filming. It would be absolutely amazing for that. So hopefully that is gonna be coming soon. Just remember, autofocus is not a simple switch that just magically makes everything perfect and in focus. It takes experience with it, time, and getting to know the settings. Hopefully this video has given you some knowledge about those settings so that you can use autofocus in a much better way. I still use manual focus for most of my filming and I will continue to do so. Mine's still in focus. If it gets to the point where I can control the focus via my mind, I will never use manual focus again. I mean, why would I? I'm hoping this feature comes into cameras sooner rather than later, 
because you know what? I do like to keep things in focus as much as possible with the least amount of effort. You never know, maybe we'll even get it in the now mythical Sony A7S III when, well, if that ever comes out. Fingers crossed. Focus. Almost. And Philip, just don't rock and don't move. And you'll be fine. Hand. I'll tell you something, if it actually moves onto her hand there, set in manual focus mode, I would really...